All right, guys, so I'm gonna make two of these videos. The first one is gonna be for Macro Jabber, and maybe I'll post it on the Friendly Bear, I'm not sure. But, um, but the second one I'm gonna post for the subscribers on the Friendly Bear. Okay, so that's what I'll do. I'll post this general one on, on the Macro Jabber, and then I'm gonna do one specifically for the Friendly Bear subscribers, because I started a subscription service there for the fans of the Friendly Bear podcast, and those who wanna see like the inside of like, my life outside of trading because like i've designed my life outside of trading to help my trading for example okay so i'm here in downtown los angeles uh i live about a block away from this beautiful iconic building walt disney concert hall and then right across the street is the u.s bank tower where i have the friendly bear office headquarters and where i trade out of and i've just created the macro jabber studio inside all that it's all nested in it in there so like i'm doing macro jabber friendly bear podcast trading uh i got my computer set up i got um the macro jabber couches the mics the, the logo everything's there and i got uh my friendly bear podcast zoom video or uh, studio thing organized where i just turn to the right and i can do a podcast right there so like no matter how tired i am there's no excuse but to execute 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 consistency you know it's just like not only with trading but like i brought that discipline into um into podcasting and podcasting into trading works works they, they help each other out it's freaking awesome so like even if i'm tired all i gotta do is take a quick shower do some pull-ups i put i posted on twitter some pull-ups that i do uh on my pull-up rig in my living room and then right across the street i go to the trading office and that little walk, it actually benefits my trading. They actually have an office in the same building that I have my apartment, but I didn't want that. I wanted the office across the street. Also, it was a, a better rate, can you believe it, in the US Bank Tower, which is like iconic. It's like the tallest building in the West Coast. I have, so not only do I have the office space, but I have access to a gym inside there that I don't really use that much because I have another gym now, but I do have access to that gym. It's a beautiful gym. It's on the 54th floor. And then I have, there's a restaurant. If I want to have like, bring some friends to a restaurant or whatever, you know, outside of, you know, just, I, I get to do that. I have the option to do that. And then they have a, like this communal space to like network and they have a lot of events. Today they had like an ice cream event. That's included with the member, with the, with the office. It's on the, and that one's on the 57th floor. So like. It's beautiful. So yeah, the wind is getting kind of hard here. So I don't know if this is gonna tilt over, but um, but yeah, it's freaking awesome. And so I have all that, and I've done podcasts on that communal space level. It's freaking cool. The views, incredible. I, I even had a photographer come. We did some photos. So I'm like maximizing the value of of uh, the amenities that I have. Then in my apartment, I have a gym there as well that I don't really use, but it's there. It's like no excuse to work. I have a gym at the office, gym in the apartment, and I got a gym at the athletic club now across the street. So I've organized my whole life for success. And I learned this in, uh, well, I, I always knew it, but in Puerto Rico, when I was um, in 2021, when I was at Trade Space, like I, I did that. I organized my, I had the Trade Space office. I lived across the street. I had the grocery store. I didn't even see the beach that much. I think I went to the beach like twice. But like I was there to focus on on getting successful, nailing this trading thing down, because I had my initial success in 2020, and I didn't want that to be like a one-trick pony kind of thing. These days, we see a lot of traders that did well 2020, 21, but like their break-even or just you know like barely, maybe even red, and that's because um, they need to adapt, and not only adapt but create a life of discipline, organize your life for success make some sacrifices maybe you don't go out as much maybe you focus you got to read some new material maybe um exp you know you got to figure something out you try different things because like if you're going grinding sideways or going red for i don't know a year and a half two years um after you made a ton of money in those markets something's off because yeah something's off and it's almost like those traders are almost irrelevant and like this, a six, I, I value a six figure trader. Let's say if someone's made a hundred grand in 2022 till now, and that's had like 
good uh, equity curve and good risk management and good uh, overall performance, whether it's systematic, discretionary, whatever, over someone that made like a million bucks in 2021 and then has like made nothing since. You know, and I know a few traders that have made money in those markets and they, they, they're not here anymore. And they're not here anymore, not because they blew up or anything. It's because they didn't want to take like that pay cut. They didn't want to take that like learning, you know, like just going a year without like, you know, they didn't want to realize, okay, I am a newbie. I need to, I need to really learn. I, I was lucky to, to make some money in that market. Now I need to really learn. You know, I need to, I need to really spend a year and learn this. And maybe this year I don't make money, but I'm grateful for the money I made as a newbie. They don't have that mindset. They had the mindset, oh, I made all this money in those markets and like i don't want to take a pay cut this is a this is uh, i'll do something else maybe i'll do you know another business or real estate or whatever it is and uh they don't want to trade anymore and i never understood that until now you know as a trader when you when you're coming up you don't understand that like wait wait a second so they made all that money and then they just stopped i don't understand but it's just you know he says, you, you, it just takes a lot of time. And they didn't want to spend the time. They got lucky and they didn't want to spend the time to like reinvest in their education for the long run. You know, it's like when I, when I was in um, 2017 to 2020, I was um, studying everything I could get my hands on because I knew in the long run, it's going to pay out. I'm not worried about the, the couple grand, couple hundred bucks now because I'm focused on making a million few million multiple millions that was my goal you know and i think that just comes with maturity you know what i mean as me i was in my in my 30s when i started this is uh 2007 17 16 so if i was a younger david i don't know that's a good you know that's interesting to think about if i was like 22 would it be like that i don't know i don't know um i know i was never the type to get swayed by lambos you know what i mean um you know, like to fall for, for the gullible stuff. I don't know. But like, I know when I came in the game, 2016, I know I was sick of the life of uh, being in debt and broke all the time. And I wanted to change that. And I knew it was gonna take a lot of work because I had a lot of catching up to do. So I think that mentality right away, it helped. You know, and then the whole burning the boats, I always talk about that, burning the boats, burning Cortez. Um, that helps. That helped a lot, you know? So anyway, going back to this, so like, I like this. It's like, I have this mobile setup now. I can just, I have this mic I just clip on. I have my little stopwatch thing right there. And I do this on my iPhone. So this is what I'm talking about, being like, organizing everything for success. I don't got to call anybody to hold this phone. I don't got to call, get an editor. I don't need anything. I just, I found a way, I, I bought this mic. It has two, so I can do interviews with them also if, if I want. I have this clock that keeps track of the time. Boom, execute. I can put this tripod in my bag if I want. Boom. So I want to do like, um, I want to get the subway station, uh, me talking in front of the subway station, all the subway stations, um, the places I used to go for walks, the places I used to study while I was in the other previous office. And like, I think it's good to remember where you grinded from. And as long as I'm in LA, because I don't plan on being in LA forever. Um, but as long as I'm here, I want to document that. I want to document my journey that I did when I was grinding. You know what I mean? Because some people, you know, some people, they don't see, they just got a hold of like my, what I'm doing now with the podcast and stuff. They didn't see the grind. You know, even when I was in Puerto Rico, looking at those old videos, when I started the podcast, that was grind mode. You know, um, I had Audrey here, the co-host of Macro Driver. She was saying, man, it looks like you filmed it out of, like you filmed it inside of a potato. I was like, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew, I knew the knowledge that I was getting from trading and the people, and I wanted to get more knowledge, but I didn't know how to do video. I never even did iPhone videos. I was not even on Instagram much. I think my Instagram had like five photos. And the only photos I knew how to take was like architecture photography, like, like this, you know what I mean? So, you know, um, that's all I knew. So, okay, so I said I was gonna do two videos. So this is, I guess, it, where, should I, where should I talk about? Yeah, I guess this one will go for the overall friendly bear. But yeah, so 
I plan on doing a lot of these. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, this is going to be the, the Macro Driver video. So, yeah, this is Walt Disney Concert Hall. Big deal for me because I came to L.A. to study architecture under Frank Gehry when he was teaching at UCLA. And he designed this building. And um, it's crazy, the story he has. So, he got, like, recognition as an architect in his 50s. Before 50 years old, nobody knew who he was. You know, he was just working as, a, as an architect doing generic buildings. He had some success, but he was mediocre to above average uh, architect. And, then, and that's because he was working for people and like he couldn't get clients by doing the work that he liked, which is like art, art form. And like, you know, as you see, this is a, art, this is art. So, but nobody understood it when he drew it on a paper or crumbled paper and would describe it and be like, this is what I want, it's sunlight coming through here and the people and this is like organic, blah, blah, blah. People didn't understand it, they're like, what? So it was just alien to them. So he would do just generic buildings, pretty, on, you know, pretty materials. And like, for example, here in Santa Monica, Third Street Promenade, the old buildings that are like uh, in a row, he designed that whole strip. And that's pretty much cookie cutter. It's cute. It still, it still is popular today, but it's nothing crazy. It's a cute place. Everybody probably knows where it is. If you've been to LA, you know Santa Monica, Third Street Promenade. So, um, yeah, so and then in his 50s, he got tired of that. And he, he actually made some money with real estate. Well, like, he didn't focus on real estate, but he bought houses and then, like, sold them for a profit, held on to them, and he had rental units, I believe. And, like, he was able to do that, and that was enough to get him financially liberated enough so he can start his own firm. And, and he had connections, uh, you know, so like from his youth in, the, in his community where he was like, like he, he knew like the guys that are doing symphonies and orchestras. He also went to Harvard. So like, you know, he had some, he had a network, you know, and so, but anyways, he got, the, when he started his firm, he wasn't looking to get clients for money. He was looking to just create his art and if people liked it, they liked it. So he was able to get like some art, art clients, artist clients, and he didn't make much money, but he wanted to build it so he can get the recognition and then like other people that were, that liked it would, other, yeah, other people that liked it would get attracted and they would become his clients. It's, it's crazy, man. It's kind of like the Friendly Bear podcast. You know, at first there was like some haters, like, oh man, I would get messages. What do you think you are? His mic sucks. You don't know what you're talking about, blah. But then, like uh, some some already successful traders would would uh, they would support me, and I got especially at Trade Space in Puerto Rico. So that's what it, it was so important for me to be in a in a place with successful people already. So like the outsiders that would comment, they don't know what they're talking about. So, but you know, you do get haters. So anyway, but I got a lot of support, and then I became very close with the, with the people that supported me. You know, you become friends like brothers, and then like. So that's what like Frank Gehry was doing. So like I come over here all the time and I think about the origin of Frank Gehry. And I know this, these, in, in, uh, these details because I had him as a professor. You know, they don't talk about it much in the books. They kind of just show his buildings. They describe it. They show the Bilbao and uh, the Guggenheim in Bilbao. They show old oh, Prixer Prize winner, top architect. But what about the genesis? What about like, what, how did he get there? Was he born rich? I was like, man, was he born rich? Did he come up from the from the ashes? You know, like what was his trajectory? Did he have it made? Who was this guy? So, you know, he was, oh, actually, I know the whole thing, so I'll sum it up real quick. He's Canadian, came to the US, he went to uh, USC. Um, I think he went to community college. He actually drove a truck. He was a truck driver to support himself through college. Then he went to USC, University of Southern California, right here, architecture. Learn the basics. It wasn't anything glamorous back then. It's just like the nuts and bolts architecture. It still kind of is. Then he went to Harvard for a year. Then he dropped out of Harvard. And then like he worked as an architect. Then he changed his name. He married his wife and he changed his name. He didn't like his name Goldsmith, I think it was. Or Goldstein, Goldstein. And he changed it to Gary. He recreated himself. He reinvented himself. So like these things matter to me. You know what I mean? These details, like recreating yourself. And so he, one of his quotes in is like, architecture is, um, frustration is liquefied, no, is liquefied talent or 
Yeah, frustration is liquefied. So like when you're frustrated, that's when you create your best things. You find solutions, you grind, you know, you, you, you're finding that thing. So like when, so like, yeah, anyway, for, for me, when I finished architecture school and I faced all that, I was like, man, how do I start my own firm? Because like Gary started his own firm in his 50s. I was like, I'm never going to be able to do it because I'm not financially liberated. I'm going to be paying back these student loans forever. I'm going to be working, doing things I don't like. So I got to I got to change something very drastic. So it's like outside the box thinking, you know, um, what, do they, what do they call this? Uh, anyway, I, I forgot the other term for it, outside the box thinking. But um, blue ocean strategy, you know, so like I'm like, if, I like architecture, but I don't want to do this like this. This is the way that everybody does this. This is the rat race. So I was like, OK, um, what I'm going to do is. I'm gonna find a way to make a ton of money. If I have all these student loans, I need to 10X those student loans. And then like, I can uh, start from there. And then like, I can revisit architecture on my own terms, like Gary, and just design, let's say I design some artwork and then people like it. And now I just keep doing that, you know? So, but it all starts with being successful with something else that can make a lot of money. And that is, for me, it was the stocks. So I fell into the stocks. I, I, I played around with real estate a little bit for like a couple months. And I was like, you know what? I found out about stocks. I first tried real estate, the classes I signed up and I was ready to do that. But then like as I'm studying real estate for financial reasons and, and trying to get financially literate. So I, was, I knew I was financially illiterate. I was like, okay, I need to get financially literate as I'm studying real estate. And I was like, you know what? Real estate is like a business. It's like you got to do marketing. You got to do all this. You got to knock door to door. And I was ready to do it. I was ready to grind. You know, I was mindset was that. But then like I came across stocks as I was studying to get financially literate. And I was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to do this. This is more like performance based. And it's all me. There's no marketing. There's no investment in marketing. None of that. Let's get education and grind. Study, go in a hole and, and just grind. So that is what I did. That is what I did. And, uh, and it all comes down to like this building. You know, it's crazy. All the, all the things I had with Frank Gehry in, his, in the classes, and um, I remember in, in the, they call it the Silicon Beach. So the, the one year of classes with Gary and Tom Main, they were in Silicon Beach. Um, they called it the Supra Studio of UCLA, the Supra Studio, which is a Masters of Architecture studio that's in Silicon Beach. It's a new beach that we're trying to like get off the vibes of like Silicon Valley in San Francisco. This one's Silicon Beach in Playa Vista. So they had his studio there in, um, what's it called? Uh, that, 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 the airplane guy from back in the day, the aviator guy, I forgot his name. But the aviator guy, they made a movie, Leonardo DiCaprio playing the movie. Uh, they had the hangar uh, of, of the airplane called the Spruce Goose. It was the largest plane to ever take off. And it was going to be made for like a World War II, I believe. Um, anyways, it, it, did, it did technically take off on land on water. So it, it did technically take off, but uh, they couldn't really get it like on a big flight. But that was the largest plane to ever take off, I believe. It's, it, you know, at the time, until then, I'm sure they have more now. But anyway, so that hangar was our studio. So like the, the, the ceiling was like massive. It must have been like 50 feet tall. And we're, I'm there with a tiny desk in the middle. But yeah, that was... Out of all those classes and all those computer programs that we were learning back then and like applying, the main lesson I got was out of that, the, the takeaway to this day is like, okay, so he had to go do things backwards a little bit. He did things backwards. So first he got himself financially free. Then he designed whatever he liked because he wasn't uh, doing work for anybody. He just doing what he liked. He didn't care about money, even though it wasn't a lot of money, but like he was, he was free to do what he liked. And when he did what he liked, he attracted people that liked what he liked and he be, they became super friends, you know? Cli those are clients for life, friends for life. So anyway, this finally, he's, he's in the period of, of uh, his stage of his life where he's doing whatever he wants at this point. And he's, um, in 1991, I believe, yeah, he gets the, the commission for Disney Concert Hall. And even though, People know him as like, you know, he's doing things a little weird at this time. And remember, there's no computer programs uh, back then. But he, he's just doing things like crumbled paper and he's drawing. And uh, even though people know like, oh, this is Frank Gehry. He's well, he's well known. And like, he, he, I think he won a, the Prixer Prize top award. 
even then, when he presented these drawings of this place, people were like, this is weird, man. We, you just make a regular building, bro. Just stamp your name on it. Like, we don't, this is too much. And um, it was all concrete back then, because this is 1991. They didn't have, um, they didn't have the technology and the computer programs to do that. So he, this was all uh, with the concrete kind of model and the concrete drawings. So it's kind of weird if you think about it. Imagine this concrete. Anyways, they put the plants on a shelf. And then in 1996, uh, he got the contract in Bilbao, Spain for the Guggenheim. And the Guggenheim, now they had some, 1996, they had better technology back then. It said some computers. And actually he was uh, the one, since he was doing what he liked, it's like play. It's like, you know, with trading now, I feel like it's like play. I'm just having fun. I'm not like grinding, grinding. I'm not forcing myself. It's just like I'm playing. So it was like that with him because like he, you know, at this, at this stage of his career, he was playing. And uh, he got a hold of like, he used to do his crumbled paper, this and this. And he said to, to his engineers that worked at his firm, said, how do we make this into a building? These crumbled papers. They're like, man, we don't, we don't know how to do that. We don't, you know, he's like, you got to find a way to make it happen. He went like Steve Jobs mode. And then uh, someone mentioned, eventually some Indians that he hired mentioned hey, you know, there's a aerospace industry, there's this computer program for aerospace in industry, it does these metallic curves. It's not exactly the crumble paper, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's cool, it's unique, and like, it, it's, it's cool, let's try it out. So, he liked it. And uh, these curves that came from aluminum, from uh, uh, airplanes, he decided to buy that software, it's called Katia, and then he patented for, for architecture, he added like doors and windows and some architectural elements to the program. But he, he bought it, he patented it, and he brought it to architecture. So he's coming with um, the mindset of play. He's in the mode of playing. See, like when you're grinding and you're working for someone, you're designing a bathroom, you're designing a toilet, you're designing a parking lot, this is stuff that's like not enjoyable. So like you're stuck in that mode. That's why like if you're in deep debt, like student loans, you can never be at that next, that higher frequency because, because you're stuck with all that, all that burden on your shoulders. So you wanna free up that burden so you can play, you can enjoy, you can, you know, and like with, with trading, it comes like that. So when you get profitable and you create a cushion and now you can do things with the money that, are, that you enjoy, let's say you travel, let's say you, like for me, I, I have, I organize my life in enjoyable, uh, way to be productive and to create content to do things i like to spend time with people i like that puts me in the mode of playing i get better ideas in the shower of like what i need to trade like ideas just pop up i'm enjoying you know so he was at that mode so anyway he he gets uh the computer programs uh to fit architecture from from the airplane industry the aerospace industry he in spain they just love him they're like Gary, whatever you want to do, just do it, man. You're free. And he, he was like, wow, this is crazy. In the U.S., they wanted me, the clients wanted to tell me to, to just stamp my name on it for the Gary brand and just, like, make something different of what I really want. But they want me to do more of what I want. They're like, yo, Gary, go for it. And they had the European Union, the money from the European Union, which is, like, a ton of money, and to finance it. So he made... um. What's that material? It's, uh, ah, man, it's, 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 it's like steel, stainless steel, just like this, but it turns yellow in the rain. Um, I forgot the name, man. I, I'm rusty. I haven't been paying attention to architecture stuff for a while now. But, um, but yeah, ah, oh, man, I forgot the name. I used to know this stuff so well. This is always, like, I'm so into trading now. I'm so focused and I'm present in the moment that I'm forgetting these, like, details from the past, which is actually is a great sign. I need to move on. I need to focus on my goals of trading and this and that. Architecture can come later. I can, you know, that's later. But um, but yeah, so anyway, he does he he designs the Guggenheim in Bilbao. Everybody knows that building, you know? And then when that got built, so it got built from 1996 to 2001. Uh I th I think something like that. Late 90s and then it finished like 2000 or something like that. And then Disney Hall came back and said, hey, why didn't you, you know, do something like that for us? And he's like, yeah, I did. I, I was trying to, but you guys put it on the shelf. And they're like, no, man, 
Here you go, do it. So sometimes, you know, in human beings, you know, a lot of times we need to see proof. You know what I mean? But like, yeah, he, he had it the whole time. So anyways, they brought the, the project back up and he applied the, the aerospace architecture software programs to do this. And um, they built it in a couple of years. And instead of the, the material in Bilbao, they used stainless steel and it actually ended up being really cheap. Uh, it looks like a super expensive building, but it's actually really cheap. And the steel is not like perfectly aligned. It's like, it's not perfect, you know? And that's part of his art. It's like, his, Gary's art, it looks perfect, but it's not. It's just like, it's almost like, like a, it was put together by just regular people. You know what I'm saying? And that goes with a lot of things in life. You don't gotta be perfect. It's like these podcasts. The main thing is to pump them out. You know what I mean? I hate, you know, pump, the word pump. Uh, but like, to be consistent and put stuff out. It's the, it's the, what, what is the, the main, the main thing with it? You know what I mean? The main thing is, is the form, is the way it reflects, is like how the people get the music, experience the music inside, which is that it has the best acoustics in the world, but it's not perfect. You go and see the details, they don't line up uh, when you go in, in there. It's not perfect. You know, just like the podcast, I don't edit it. Yeah, I might say, um, whatever. That's not the point of it, you know? Um, I remember when I first started the podcast, you'd be like, oh, make a clip. This is too long. Oh, you know, you have a lot of fluff. Bro, I don't care. And like, I don't want those people, I don't want to be around those people anyway. Those people are like, what are they going to, how are they going to help me be a better trader or be a better whoever I want to be? They're just negative. They're trying to project their, they're not happy and they're trying to project that to you. So like, you can, you can go. I don't care. I don't care. Like, I'm happy with my life, man. This is all bonus that I'm building and I know the people that like it, they're going to be attracted to like my world and I get to bring them in my world and now we share information and knowledge and that's how you unlock a big, a bigger picture potential and that's how you grow exponentially. And I, and I know this because that's what exactly what happened with the Friendly Bear podcast. So um, what else? I, I went over Gary. I've been meaning to do this for a while, you know, like talk about the Frank Gary topic and how like that applies to me and I think about that all the time. Um, and it's just a really cool building. So now it's like sunset, it's the summer. It's, um, yeah, cool building, man, well-renowned. And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna do more podcasts in, uh, coming up, so stay tuned.